Dr. Sumitra Bata, I hope I didn't butcher it too badly. Did, did I, how'd I do? Like, Perfect. Um, not be out. Okay. All right. It, it sounds like totally like, I think I've got it. And then I get up here and stuff comes out. Okay. So Dr. Samita Bata is a board certified oncologist and the vice president of global medical affairs at the head of oncology at Amcha. Um, she's ever had, she's had over nine years of experience in the biopharma industry and held a number of research and development, developmental roles. And so today we're just pleased as punch to have you join us. And I see, what, what did we call your topic? Understanding how a new drug treatments are brought to market, which we're really interested in knowing about and having better understanding. So I hope that we have a few minutes at the end to answer questions. So welcome. Thank you, Terry. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And you'll tell me if I did it right in just a second. I think, well, we need the um, presenter mode. Okay, here we come. There you go. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks to everybody in the room and online. This is a great pleasure of mine to uh, be able to speak to you all. I wish it could have been in person. Um, you know, I just wanna echo what Dr. Ahn had just finished with, which is the patients and the patient caregivers are really my why. It's the why I go to work and why I work in drug development. And so this is really a huge highlight for me to have uh, this opportunity. So thank you very, very much. So today we will be talking about understanding how new drug treatments are brought to market. And we'll go through this overview. So first we'll speak about overview of the drug development process. And this will really be the bulk of the presentation. We'll talk about how then regulatory authorities look to analysis of data from clinical trials and making their decisions at a very high level. We'll look at what we should be thinking about when we compare clinical trials. What are some considerations that should come to mind? And then finally, we'll end with enrolling in a clinical trial. What are some of the benefits? What are some of the risks? And how can you go about doing that if you should so be interested? Cancer drug development is a multi-step process. You can see that there are multiple parts of drug development that lead ultimately to a patient being able to receive a drug. The first step is discovery and development. First, we have to find compounds that could be potentially beneficial. The next step is preclinical research. So before these patients even, even, even before these drugs even enter a patient, there is a ton of research that is done to make sure that it's appropriate to move on to the next step. The third step is clinical research. It's what a lot of you may have already been involved in or may consider being involved in in the future. And that's really investigating whether a new drug can benefit you in a safe manner. Step four is the regulatory review process. Here we've highlighted the FDA, but as you know, there are multiple health authorities across the world that use similar type of processes in determining whether or not drugs really should be available for us. And step five is really the FDA approval and post-marketing process. So sometimes not all questions are answered in the clinical trial that leads to approval. And this opportunity, step five, is a process by which questions can be answered in greater detail. So this is an interesting figure because it really highlights the multiple steps that are required in each of these different segments to get a drug to market. It also highlights the number of potential drugs that get whittled down before they actually make it to a phase three trial and subsequently to an approval. You can see from the funnel that there's multiple drugs that enter the drug discovery process, multiple potential candidates. And through these steps of drug optimization, which is really ensuring that the structure of the molecule is appropriate, preclinical testing in both uh, cell lines and animals, and then clinical trials, fewer and fewer and fewer drugs actually make it to the finish line. That's uh, important to highlight because you can see that the median time to develop a cancer drug is about seven years. And the median cost to develop a cancer drug is around $650 million. And that is uh, very much due to the fact that all of these processes with so many candidates have to take place before you get to the winning asset. 
So we'll talk a little bit about step one and two of the drug development process, that is drug discovery and preclinical research. Drug discovery can happen in multiple ways. Sometimes it's accidental. Sometimes drug discovery comes from things that we already have in nature, like plants, funguses, things that are uh, you know, generally already available. For example, uh, you know, a cancer drug that we all know very well, paclitaxel came from a tree. Um, and there are other drugs that have come from things like sea sponges. And so this accidental discovery happens. Amgen takes what we call a biology first approach, whereby we try to understand the biology of a drug, uh, of a disease, and then we try to identify a drug that can target that, that uh, aberrant or uh, mistaken pathway. So for example, we try to analyze the genetic makeup of a cancer and compare that to what happens in healthy cells. And once we can figure out what the difference is, we can try to develop a drug against that. That is by and large uh, how targeted therapies are developed. That is also an approach that's taken for immunotherapies, which are drugs that harness the body's own immune system to fight off different types of cancers. Once this is done and drug discovery has occurred and the actual compound has been optimized, these agents can go into preclinical research. And preclinical research encompasses a host of different types of activities. The drugs first undergo laboratory testing, generally in human cell lines, to determine whether or not there's any impact. And if there is, then drugs can go into animal testing. This is generally called the in vivo approach to assess their potential side effects, but also to determine a safe dose for first in human studies. A term that's often used here is MABEL, which stands for uh, minimal anticipated biological level. And this is what we can get from these animal tests and this minimal anticipated biological level is often used, not always, often used to determine the starting dose for phase one trials for which humans are now going to be enrolled. The next step is the clinical research process. Before this can happen, an investigational new drug application is submitted to health authorities. That's called an IND for short. And the IND has within it the data that was just generated from the preclinical studies and uh, more information about the drug compound, as well as the clinical plan that we think we're going to need to demonstrate the activity of this drug to benefit patients. That, uh, regulatory authorities will look at this data and determine whether that's an appropriate plan. And if it is, they'll allow us sponsors which sponsors, by the way, can be pharmaceutical companies or it can be academic centers to initiate clinical trials. So the first phase of clinical trials is phase one. We generally consider this early phase clinical trial testing. And here the primary goals are to establish safety and the dose of the drug. Oftentimes we're also looking to understand how the drug works in the human body. We use some terms such as pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics to describe this. Pharmacokinetics can be things like how well is the drug absorbed? How is it, ex how is it metabolized? How is it eliminated? Which organ in the body is responsible for elimination? Meanwhile, pharmacodynamics can be such elements of, is the drug acting upon a certain marker in the body that we would expect it to, maybe decrease of a protein level or uh, you know, something similar that could just let us know whether the drug is achieving its target. The length of time for this phase of clinical development is variable. It can either range from several months to several years. It can be less than 100 patients to more than several hundred patients, depending on how the study is designed. Generally, the next step in clinical trials is phase two drug development. And again, the goal here is to continue to now test that safety that we think we are confident about in phase one, but also now look for signals of efficacy. 
Phase two drug development can be done as single arm trials where patients are only getting the drug of interest, or this can be randomized where the patients are getting the drug of interest against what they might already be receiving that's already been approved. Again, there's a lot of variability in how this gets done. And this can take months to years. Um, you know, we say three years here, but again, this is a very variable process depending on the type of drug that's developed in the multiple different uh, 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 pathways that this phase two drug development process can take. Now we're sort of moving into the later phases of development. Phase three, for example, is when we're really seeking to confirm now the effectiveness of a drug against what is generally considered standard of care in a larger group of people. And this can take up to four years, sometimes even more, depending on the complexity of the trial. The goal here is now to really confirm whether this candidate drug can improve outcomes over what's already available to patients. And finally, and this can lead to approval of the drug, um, generally speaking, that phase four part of drug development is there for monitoring after approval and to answer some of those unanswered questions that we didn't necessarily get through phase one to phase three of development. Now, I just highlighted what's considered a traditional path to market, but if a drug is spectacular and has a tolerable side effect profile that makes it promising, there are some approaches that the FDA can give us to make drugs available more quickly. So on the top left, we'll start with fast track designation. So this is a, uh, an opportunity to speed up drug development and a review of data to allow faster approval of drugs to treat serious conditions for an unmet medical need. So an unmet medical need, what does that exactly mean? An unmet medical need is where potentially there's no treatment available for a particular disease, or where there's a potential to improve upon what's already available, whether it be with greater efficacy or a better safety profile. What is the benefit of fast track? designation? Well, it offers the opportunity to interact with our regulatory authorities with more agility. We have more opportunity for written communication, more meetings. Uh, potentially, we have a rolling approval process, which would mean that as data is generated, it gets submitted for ongoing review rather than everything being compiled and submitted altogether later on. And again, the goal here is to speed up the drug development process. Typically, the sponsor asks the FDA for this designation and the FDA can then decide whether or not it's appropriate to grant this or not. The next type of approach is called breakthrough therapy designation. And this is generally given when drugs have demonstrated already that there's substantial improvement or the potential for substantial improvement over existing therapies. This affords many of the same opportunities that fast track designation gives, such as more agility and communication. This is generally either requested by the sponsor or even at some times requested by the regulatory authorities given what they've seen with the data to date. On the upper right-hand side of the slide, you can see that there's something called an accelerated approval. This is a program that allows for quicker approval of drugs for areas of high unmet need or serious conditions based on generally what's called a surrogate endpoint. So what's a surrogate endpoint? A surrogate endpoint is a measure that often predicts overall benefit or ultimate benefit to a patient. Generally, it's not the true marker of, for example, survival, but it can be, for example, response rate that correlates with survival in the end. If a drug is approved via the accelerated approval pathway, generally another trial will be needed to confirm the results with the endpoint of interest. And if, for example, that confirmatory study doesn't confirm what the accelerated approval pathway has shown, a drug can actually be pulled from the market. The final approach that I wanna to discuss today is priority review. 
this is an opportunity that we, the FDA can provide whereby they um, commit to taking action on a drug application within six months instead of the standard 10 month review timeline. This is again done when there's promising activity, when there's really high end met need, where there's a desire to make drugs available to patients quicker than normal. And, and, and generally this is something that the sponsor can request uh, and then the FDA can look at and decide whether it's appropriate and give that designation. So we've talked about generally what the lengths and are for development. Here's an example of you know, an accelerated drug development timeline from initial clinical trial to FDA approval and after. And, and what the reason we want to show you this is again to highlight that when a drug has compelling properties, there can be an opportunity to accelerate its development. And, and I think this is the goal for for all of us, as long as it's done in a responsible way to allow patients to receive therapies that they may benefit from as soon as possible. Again, it has to be done in a responsible way. So here you'll see phase one development for this hypothetical drug began in August of 2018. The drug received many of the opportunities afforded by the FDA, breakthrough therapy designation, priority review, um, and ultimately accelerated approval uh, within th a three year time period. You can see then that the line below that demonstrates the phase three timeline. This is the confirmatory study that's required to then make sure that the data that was seen in that accelerated approval study is true and is confirmed by the um, endpoint of interest here. And uh, there are also other questions that hadn't been answered. And so the drug, it has an ongoing phase four study as well. I, again, the important thing to highlight here is that there are opportunities for drug development acceleration. It has to be done in a very thoughtful way in partnership with regulatory authorities. And the key goal is to ensure that it's responsibly developed to ensure that patients are not being exposed to an unsafe therapy, um, you know, it, it, just for the sake of speed. Now, how is data analyzed? The FDA has a team of physicians, statisticians, chemists, pharmacologists, a variety of other scientists that review the data that's been submitted. And generally this can be data from several clinical trials that get submitted through a marketing application. The FDA with all of its team can opine on the value of that product for patients. They may need additional data. They may ask for an advisory committee where they call upon experts for their recommendation. They may also request additional studies or more data to make sure that they feel comfortable with, with the decision that they're making. Primarily, the decision is based on the benefit versus the risks. And this is probably true for many of the things that we do in life, but this is you know, of utmost importance here for, uh, for the FDA. And then they render a marketing approval decision based on all the available data that they have in partnership with the company or the institution submitting the data. Now you'll come across tons of data from, you'll go to ASCO, you'll go to ASH, you'll go to you know, many of these, these congresses where data presentations are being made one after the other after the other. And how do you, how do you interpret all of this? It becomes very complicated. And so, Generally speaking, cancer drugs are evaluated for approval in this phase three setting when they're typically compared with what's already available to patients. And this is called standard of care in a clinical trial. The reason that this is done is comparison with standard of care allows assessing the new drug to see if it's superior, equal, or inferior to the existing drug that's being used to treat the disease. And this is true not only for efficacy, but also for safety. When you see trials from different drugs, there is a tendency to want to compare those results to one another. But it's actually um, quite important that we take caution when doing things, uh, when trying to compare results from separately conducted trials, because these trials can be very different in the types of patients that were enrolled, the interventions that were made, the severity of the disease what patients may have gotten prior to enrollment on the studies, et cetera. So there's a multitude of factors 
that make it very challenging to compare one study to the other. And why is this important? It's just very easy to misinterpret data uh, without fully understanding the differences in those trials. So what are some possible benefits and risks of joining a clinical trial? You'll see them here on the screen. Some possible benefits of joining a cancer clinical trial is that you may ultimately advance cancer research and help someone else with the same disease that you have that might be afflicted with this disease later down the line. You might also get benefit from the drug. You could get a treatment that's not available outside the trial that um, you ultimately do benefit from. Uh, you'll likely be able to see your cancer team more often because these trials often require more visits for some of the monitoring that we discussed. Um, and so that you can you know, be checked more frequently for some of the side effects you might be feeling. And some of the expenses that you may face may be paid for as part of your enrollment in a clinical trial. However, there are also risks of joining a cancer clinical trial. Especially in early stages, we really don't have all the answers for side effects. And oftentimes this evaluation is being done in patients for the very first time. Also, the treatment may simply not work. It may not be efficacious, especially in the earlier lines of clinical trials. While I just said one of the benefits could be more frequent visits to the hospital, that could also not be a benefit for folks who live further away from the treatment facility or have more barriers to getting care. So more doctor visits may not necessarily be a good thing as it in includes more time and travel. If you're part of a randomized study and you get randomized to the standard of care arm, you may not have a choice then to get the active therapy. And while I said some costs may be covered, this is not all, always the case. Insurers may not cover all costs of the clinical trials. And so this can be uh, you know, a financial element that needs consideration. Now, if you're interested in a, a clinical trial or a loved one is interested in a clinical trial or a friend or someone else that you work with is, it's important to know that generally these clinical trials are carefully supervised, monitored, and documented because this is research that is conducted in humans. They help determine if the study drugs and treatments are safe and if they produce desired results. And there are several ways in which patients can enroll. That information is um, listed below. Your physician can also tell you about what may be available at their center. And with that, that concludes the main portion of the presentation. I'd be happy to take questions, but before I do, I just once again want to reiterate how important it is uh, for us to have these types of engagements, how valuable your feedback and questions are, and um, that you truly are the reason why many of us go to work every day, especially me. So. That's it. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. It really kind of helped like simplify what the process is in order to get to a clinical trial, what a drug has to do in order to get to us as like becoming the standard of care, the latest and greatest. I do have a question and I'm not sure if there's gonna be anything from the audience, but if a drug's already been approved for another use, does it have to start back at phase one? How, how does it get approved for a different type of a use? Yes, uh, the question, the answer to that question, Terry, is it does. It does have to go back into phase one testing um, because the dose may not be the same in a different type of patient or a different type of cancer. So all of the safety data has to be regenerated from the beginning. I, we can probably, even the preclinical data, frankly, is generated for new tumor types. Okay, and then as far as like that, that data that's analyzed, like, so it, but it's, it's, our information about what's going on in our cancer, it's not like our personal information. So it, patient level data is submitted. And it, I think that's the crux of the question. Forgive me if I've misinterpreted it. Patient level data is submitted as well as aggregate data to regulatory authorities. And multiple, I mean, numerous analyses are done to look at the data and cut it in different ways to ensure that we're properly understanding the side effects and the efficacy parameters. So it is your patient level data or your loved one's patient level data that is being examined as well as group aggregation of data. Okay. All right. So a part of it becomes a math solution then. Okay. And then what about a C, 
Um, I'm just going to read the question from the chat. I've noticed no one has discussed using AI, which is artificial intelligence in drug development to reduce developmental timeline or identify new drugs or repurpose to prove drugs. Is this being done or um, in order in seen that you know of? I would, I would say that there are efforts being made to address these issues. Um, I think AI, we still have some time for that to, to be done, but it is being looked at. Real world data is another place that there's tremendous promise for. For example, patients are being treated with drugs in the real world setting. And sometimes this data can be used to, to give us some information about the historical control arm. Um, and that can limit the amount of data that has to be generated in exposing patients to drugs that are already available because we have numerous plethoras of data that already exist. So uh, you're right, we haven't mentioned it, but it is going on in the background. Um, and real world data especially is a major contributor. It's something that regulatory authorities look at, something we're expected to generate, frankly. Um, the other thing we haven't mentioned that is, is really important, I think, to mention is uh, diversity in clinical trials. And so we are, the FDA has now mandated that uh, we, we, we provide a diversity plan. So how are we going to have representation from different ethnicities, races, genders, et cetera, as part of these clinical trials? What's our plan? And we're obligated to think about this. I think it's extremely important that we think about this because uh, we know that the patients who actually receive the drugs once they're approved are not necessarily the same that were enrolled in that clinical trial. So we do need to start generating data on diversity as well. Okay, great. And I think we had a question from the audience. We saw a, a big change in drug development timelines with the COVID vaccine and a push there. Uh, with the Cancer Moonshot initiative, uh, do you see the drug development timeline being compressed? Uh, and then kind of a secondary question to that, how much of the timeline is medically driven and how much of it is just gov governmental or bureaucracy driven? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the moonshot, I think it had a second set of wings after COVID. You know, moonshot has been around for a little bit of time, but COVID has really highlighted the ability to bring drugs to market faster. Now, whether or not this will improve the opportunity for oncology drugs, I think is still a bit unknown. I will tell you that there is a sense of urgency in development of these drugs. I think we all feel it, including the government. So I think, you know, to answer your question about whether this is bureaucracy and process versus the medical need, uh, frankly, I do think there is, there, it is important to do, to take our time in the appropriate ways to develop these drugs we're all working, I think, as fast as we can, but we do really need to ensure that we're not subjecting patients to side effects or untoward impact just because we were on a kick for speed. And this is going to uh, obviously be different depending on the level of unmet need. So where there is uh, opportunities where nothing is available, the timeline is accelerated. Where there are multiple things that are available, I think you'll see it being a little bit longer. And I think this speaks to the variability in timelines in general. Okay. Um, as far as communication between like a pharmaceutical company and the hospital locations, do you have any suggestions how to expedite or improve that communication? Terry, I may not fully understand the question. So, um, you know, I don't know if this question comes from. I, I think it's a matter of like we'll see, like say if we go to, like say we go to the, your website and we see there's a clinical trial or something is going to be enrolling and we're trying to get into it or have access to it, find out if we qualify for it. Um, and it's not always easy for us as a patient to get the information that we need, even from like the PI, principal investigator or from the hospital setting. Do you have any suggestions as far as how we can like open up those lines of communication? Yes, it's a great question. I think it is actually an area of improvement that we need to be working on as a collective universe. Um, I think you know your patient advocacy groups, KRAS kickers, et cetera, can, can de definitely help in navigating the process, but the, comp the process is extremely complex. The one thing that I can continue to say is, you know, some of these websites can give you um, guidance and direction on where these clinical trials are being offered, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a spot available, et cetera. So there is some investigation that will have to take place 
there isn't an easy solution now to know whether there's a slot available, for example, for a phase one study, even though you know that phase one study is running at a particular institution. So there is still some work to be done there, I think, in improving that, that dialogue. The one thing, though, I would tell you is be your, be your advocate as you all are, you know, contact your physician, get the available information. Um, if it's not necessarily available at the institution that you're at, perhaps it's locally available somewhere nearby. Um, and so I, I wish I had a better answer to that question, Terry, I really do, but I think it's still a, a pretty complex process to navigate and there's still work to be done there. I think there's a lot of communication channels that need to open up. We have another question from the audience. Um, yes, I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. One, on this uh, breakthrough or fast track, can those um, expedited paths be combined or is it uh, just one or the other? And then the other question is, I mean, they're talking about for unmet needs, but what pharmaceutical company would spend millions of dollars on something that wasn't, you know, an urgent unmet need? I'm, I, it just seems like almost all of them would qualify. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. So the first is yes. The, the first answer is there are, you can have more than one of those pathways implemented in your drug development process. You can start with fast track. You can then be granted breakthrough. You can then be granted accelerated approval and then a priority review. So in fact, you can have all of them. Um, the second answer to your question is, is, is a great one. Why would someone spend their time and energy trying to develop drugs that don't that don't necessarily have high unmet need, and and the answer is I think by and large, uh, all of the drugs that are are being developed by sponsors are generally committed to improving what's already available for standard of care with standard of care therapies. Oncology drug development happens to be a situation in which the majority of drugs that are being developed are being developed because the solutions we have today are not necessarily optimal. You know, I think I think there you could argue that there are maybe some other diseases that don't necessarily always fit the qualification of unmet need, but in oncology, this is generally the case. Okay, and I see um, another one. Um, let's see. Can you talk about why there's a possibility of? Okay, let me rephrase that again. Um, excluding patients that have certain prior treatments, such as like immunotherapy. Um, and then it kind of causes patients to like hold out to make different choices. I'm kind of trying to summarize the question that you see here in the chat. Um, can you speak to a little bit of how those items are decided? Some of it is, uh, you know, generally the items of who to include and exclude in a clinical trial are based on perceived safety. So there are oftentimes, um, compiled toxicity that can occur when somebody has already received a prior therapy and now they're receiving your therapy of interest or our therapy of, of interest. And the goal here, I think in general in medicine, but also in clinical trial development is to first do no harm. So the idea here is to try to ensure that those patients that are enrolling on the clinical trial aren't being harmed by an investigational therapy uh, because of some prior therapies or maybe their renal function or maybe their white blood cell count, et cetera, that puts them at higher risk. Okay, and I think I can see we're kind of like running short on time. So I'm gonna kind of like um, throw this out there too. It says do no harm approach has to be in the first place. This is in, from the chat. And enrolling, clinical, and enrolling patients into clinical trials makes a difference. I know that we need to include the washout periods to make sure that we know whether the treatments are being effective or not. Um, is there any way we can speed that up as far as us getting us, the patients getting involved into a clinical trial rather than causing a delay. Cause that sense of urgency when it's our life we're betting with is really intense. I know it's, um, it's, I, it's the washout period is actually not so much for efficacy as it is for safety, safety generally, because we don't want the prior side effects of the previous drug um, augmenting the side effects of the therapy that you would then be testing in a hypothetical sense. But I, I feel the struggle. I, uh, I think it's an, a very important consideration. It's one that we grapple with every day. Sometimes patients don't have time to wait. 
they don't have time to wait the 30 days that we insist that they wait upon for enrollment in a clinical trial. And this is something we're actively talking about, um, especially if there is a drug where the washout, where the side effects don't linger on that long and the washout period can be reduced. And so I will tell you that there is active effort being done to refine and revise these processes. Um, but the sense of urgency that I hear with that question is real. I hear it, I understand it, and we're working toward it. Please do hear our voices because every single person in this room and every single person online, either themselves or someone else that they love and care about, whether it's just a friend or a family member, um, it's not just a theoretical sense of urgency. This is our lives that we're playing with. And so anything that you can do corporately or that we as an organization or as advocates can do to help speed up this process, we need to know what that is and whether that boils down from the communication, establishing the clinical trial or what have you. Um, it, it, it really is. It's, um, it's, a, it's a big gamble and we need to do it. And we want to be able to get to the drugs faster, sooner, better and make sure that they work. And so thank you so much for the presentation today. It really helped to kind of like give us an awareness and set a tone for our next upcoming session around clinical trials. And, but you're not going to get away either. Um, as far as like, and, and everybody in the room is laughing. We're going to ask you to engage with our audience here on site um, and just kind of do a countdown and, and all together, um, I'm going to do one, two, three, and then the audience and you, we're all going to say kick cancers, KRAS. Are you game? I'm totally game. And I, okay. again, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Okay, cool. Okay. One, two, three. Kick cancers, KRAS. Okay, thank you. <laughs>